Joining me now, a man who cannot afford to demonise uh, spinach and other leafy greens given his <laughs> cholesterol, Phil Curry, political editor with the Australian Financial Review. Tommy. Thanks for your time as ever and always respectful of my guests. Um, <laughs> your paper today has some interesting polling. I don't think it'll have anyone falling off their chair, but mm. it's interesting to look at for this sense. The two-party preferred, which we'll bring up, has Labor solidifying a pretty strong lead that they, mm. you know, increasing it from the election, 54-46. But it's the primary voters as well. So Labor, remember, was 32.5% the yeah. election, which still got them a narrow victory. And both major parties increasing that since then, but Labor at 37. In, in, in you know, the new sort of formula, 37 is really high for Labor. They'd, mm. they'd be happy with that and trying to bed that down, I guess. Yeah, I think what it shows, and th these poll results, Tom, are consistent with what we see in news poll and resolve as others. You know, la since la the last seven months now, the Labor's been in, they've gone at it like a bull in a gate. You know, they've governed very strongly. They've done a lot in the parliament. And the, and I think what it's telling us is they're starting to consolidate power in their own right. So they, they fell across the line in... In May, there's no doubt. The non-Morrison vote got them there, yeah, and now they yeah, need to get yeah. a pro Labor. They won that election in May by their own admission because of Scott Morrison more than anything they did. So, so they, you know, they got their lowest primary vote in since 1934 and still formed government by two seats. So, this, I think, what we're seeing now is Labor, you know, starting to be rewarded for its own effort for you know sort of governing steadily, governing well, if you like. Um, you know, using the parliament, implementing its agenda, you know, restoring sort of order, if you like, back to the back to the whole system. Not all mm. of it's popular. A lot of it's been unpopular, you know, the, the industrial relations laws. But even then, if you have an agenda, people are still talking about your agenda and not something else. So, and, I mean, yeah. with those as well, the rubber's yet to hit the road. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not saying... Yeah. No, yeah. I'm just saying yeah. that, you know, the, yeah. the, the thought that opinions might solidify one way or the other once yeah. it happens and the sky falls in or otherwise. The preferred PM's an interesting mm. one. Mm. I think for a couple of reasons, you know, relatively positive for Anthony Albanese, so yeah. it shows that he hasn't stuffed things up. But Peter Dutton, I mean, it, it's relatively low at 29, but it's not the sort of dire he's had a bad first six months in the job. I feel like he's kept no. his powder dry and he's not... Not well, wading in unnecessarily. and You can lose it in the first year, but you can't win it when you're an opposition leader like this. It's like golf, isn't it? You can blow yeah. it the first two holes. But, um, <laughs> look, you know, Dutton's playing a longer game. He's patient. He's, he's not He's not getting carried away by his prospects. But mm. he, he, his, his, his goal is to get the party competitive. So if it does start turning pear shape for the government, there's a lot of tough stuff coming next year, Tom. They've done all the low-hanging fruit, but, you've, you, you know, the cost of living's still bad. You know, the war in Ukraine's still going on. Despite what they did on energy, it's not going to bring prices down and they're still going to go up. So Dutton's got to get his party to a position where they can exploit. You know, they, they, they've got to be in a position to exploit any downturn in support for the government. Now, the, the irony is the political party's in surprisingly good shape considering the election loss. You know, they're very unified. You know, they're chugging along quite happily. It's the structure of the party that's in dire trouble. And we're going to see that this week when the Liberals released their um, review yeah. and election campaign. The divisions are in diabolical states, especially New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, where they're riven by factional fighting. They've got to get more women in. They've got to get more diverse candidates in and they've got to wake up. You know, they can't... You know, they're becoming a party for people over 55 with assets and no-one else, and they've got to... You know, at the party level, they've got to be able to re-engage as much as at a parliamentary level if they're going to be in that position. Yeah, I think you make the good point around Peter Dutton. Mm. Capitalising, he's mm. not thinking I'll I'll be able to ride to prime minister on a crest well, of popularity necessarily. It's about yeah. well, opposition's always about yeah. capitalising mistakes. Well, as we saw in different this years, yeah, yeah. But again, you know, I, I don't. I make just want to bring up. Anymore. Yeah, yep, no, so. I just want to bring up cost of living. Though this is the final one we've yeah. got, and it shows again big shock. Cost of living number one with a bullet yeah. in terms of voter concerns, seventy one percent. And I've sort of. Made some of them a bit shorter than the full title, but you get the point. Well, look at the second one. That's a cost of living issue as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, housing. So rent and yeah, mortgage rent and so on. And so yeah. exactly. So look again, no surprise. Other research like that being done by John Scales is finding the same thing, and has been for a long time. And you know, the government's not going to come as a surprise to the government either. That's yeah. why, you know, they they did what they could on wages and energy prices towards the end of the year, and uh, they know they've got all of that ahead of them next year. And, and quite aside from the whole debate, and what what Labor's move will do and um, whether we really are ushering in a new Soviet era, mm. according to the gas companies. The metric is lower bills in the next 12 mm. months. And even mm. Labor's saying 
they won't be as high as they were going to be. In other words, yeah, still if you've up. got a bill right now, next yeah. year it'll be a lot higher, 20 well, something percent well, higher, depending on where you are. It, as, as a combination of the gas and coal caps, which come into effect pretty much straight away, your energy bill next financial year will be 47 percent higher than it is now, not 63 percent. So that's just as a, that's what Treasury estimates. If you're a lower middle income household and you're going to get some of this bill assistance, the details of which have to be worked out over the summer, then you'll do better again. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's sort of stopping things getting worse. Mm. Well, where do you much more worse. Yeah. And, and the other high stakes element for Labor is what gas companies are saying. Hmm. But Labor is essentially saying, we don't believe you. You're making a lot of money from yeah. exports. You'll stay. Yeah. And there's no way you'll just turn off our gas supply. So, hmm. um, but, Well, the gas companies are arguing we won't dig up more gas. Hmm. You know, and Santos' uh, chief executive, Kevin Gallo, said last week, yeah, because they're, they're ready to go on the Narrabri gas field in New South Wales, which is all meant to be for domestic gas use. It's being held up by the state government there for years. Um, but if that does get the go-ahead, Gallo is now saying he wants extra safeguards around because uh, it's got to be worth his while to dig it up and yep. if the price controls are too Which gets to the reasonable price and what mm. the government will settle on there. Um, the big thing for Labor looking forward, landing the economy and mm. part of it's sort of sitting and hoping that people don't spend too much, that prices out of their control don't yeah. go up too much and the RBA doesn't have to hike. I mean, yeah. that's... that's there are a lot of things and they've got a budget coming up, but in the short term they're just sitting there well, and hoping for good economic We're expecting years. another couple of rate increases in the new year, February and March, so it's not going to soften quickly and, uh, yeah, it's, it, there's no easy solution. And that's why, as strong as they've started, you know, their, their feet, I think, are firmly on the ground in terms of how hard it's going to get next year. And, and, and the first proper budget, hmm. if I may be so hmm. direct, next year. <laughs> Treasurer Chalmers won't like that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, that's also when Jim Chalmers said the sort of the, the tough stuff's got to start. Yeah. Remember he said we're going to... The October budget they just released was just really just a statement of where things are at. Um, but then they've got to start making a few hard calls on things and uh, that process will begin with the May budget next year. So, yeah, it's... Because uh, a lot of the saving initially was sort of a discontinuing that. Oh, yeah, there was that's a lot of hanging yeah. yeah. But in terms of cutting programs... Structural savings. Structural savings, savings times, yeah. yeah. And the old stage three tax cuts are just sitting over the horizon. They still have to yeah. be addressed. The broccoli of the budget. Uh, <laughs> so we better t ask you about Penny Wong, just yes. finally. Visit yeah. happening, 50th anniversary yeah. relations. Look, no great surprise, but, but good news. I mean, when the day after Albanese won the election, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang contacted him and said, you know, let's smoke the peace pipe and put in train this reconciliation process. And both sides have worked hard to take the temperature out of the relationship. And Premier Li back then nominated the 50th anniversary of Gough Whitlam's visit, which is Wednesday this week, 21st of December. So, yeah. so it's sort of been coming in increments. And we had the meeting in Bali a month ago between Albanese and President Xi. And this has stemmed from that. So uh, it's good... Penny Wong is off to Beijing tomorrow. She's, in, she's there for one whole day and back Thursday morning, but it is significant. First foreign minister visit, I think, for 2018, mm. I think. And, uh, uh, you know, so we hopefully will see from this an easing of trade restrictions and the freeing from jail of the two political prisoners, Cheng Lei and the academic. Hopefully, we'll, I think there's a bit of confidence in the government that we'll start to see some actual real tangible outcomes and that's, on the yeah, other and side that's of this Wong meeting. Someone Birmingham saying, that's the test. Outcomes achieved. We've got him on next day on the program. He's so I'll let you get away and furiously take notes from that. OK, mate. Thank you. <laughs> and attribute it to Sky News, as always. <laughs> Bill Curry from the Australian Financial Review. Thank you for the, the year's service as well. You, your payment is the occasional... Coffee. Mm -hmm. And the warm feeling I get from sitting here. Of course, <laughs> of course. Validation of your uh, career's work. Phil Curry there, thank you. Enjoy no your break on the coast.